Hey everybody, this is Mr. Barr. Uh, I wanted to have a quick, uh, I call these fireside chats, so I'll, I'll do a few of these throughout the year anyway. And I thought it was appropriate to use our first one to talk about the events that happened um, on September 11, 2001. There's a lot of different memories out there. There's a lot of different ways we could approach this, but I, I approach it um, with some information and then a challenge for you. So I'm going to read some passages from this book. It's called Decision Points. Um, it's by George W. Bush. When presidents leave office, oftentimes they write their memoirs, their, their story of their life, of their presidency, of their political career, whatever. His is called Decision Points, and it covers the 10 most important decisions in his life. Um, and chapter five out of this book is called Day of Fire. And so I'm going to read out of this book, the open, kind of the opening here, and uh, give you some 9-11 information. And then uh, I have a challenge for you as well. So sit back and uh, just enjoy listening. On Tuesday, September 11, 2001, I awoke before dawn in my suite at the Colony Beach and Tennis Resort near Sarasota, Florida. I started the morning by reading the Bible and then went downstairs for a run. It was pitch black as I began my jog around the golf course. The Secret Service agents had grown accustomed to my exercise routine. The locals must have found this run in the dark a little bizarre. Back at the hotel, I took a quick shower, ate a light breakfast, and skimmed the morning papers. The biggest story that day was that Michael Jordan was coming out of retirement to rejoin the NBA with the Washington Wizards. Other headlines focused on the New York mayoral primary and a suspected case of mad cow disease in Japan. Around 8 a.m., I received the presidential daily briefing. The PDB, which combined highly classified intelligence with in-depth analysis of geopolitics, was one of the most fascinating parts of my day. The September 11 briefing, delivered by a bright CIA analyst named Mike Morrell, covered Russia, China, and the Palestinian uprising in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Shortly after the PDB, we left for a visit to Emma E. Booker Elementary School to highlight education reform. On the short walk from the motorcade to the classroom, Carl Rove, my deputy White House chief of staff, mentioned that an airplane had crashed into the World Trade Center. It sounded strange to me. I envisioned a little propeller plane horribly lost. Then, my national security advisor, Condoleezza Rice, called. I spoke to her from a secure phone in a classroom that had been converted into a communication center for the traveling White House staff. She told me the plane that had just struck the World Trade Center tower was not a light aircraft. It was a commercial jetliner. I was stunned. That plane must have had the worst pilot in the world. How could he possibly have flown into a skyscraper on a clear day? Maybe he'd had a heart attack. I told Condi to, stop, to stay on top of the situation and asked my communications director, Dan Bartlett, to work on a statement promising the full support of Federal Emergency Management Services. I greeted the school's principal, a friendly woman named Gwen Rigel. She introduced me to the teacher, Sandra K. Daniels, and her room full of second graders. Mrs. Daniels led the class through a reading drill. After a few minutes, she told the students to pick up their lesson books. I sensed a presence behind me. Andy Card, pressed his, Andy Card, the White House Chief of Staff, pressed his head next to mine and whispered in my ear, a second plane has hit the second tower. America is under attack. The president stayed uh, in the classroom uh, for the remaining 15 minutes. He exited and was flown to actually off at Air Force Base in Omaha. Uh, it was where they kept the fleet of planes. They wanted to get him to a secure location. He wanted to return to Washington. Um, and, of course, later that day, a plane struck the Pentagon, and then a plane, cra Flight 93, crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. It was likely headed for the White House. Um, three days later, uh, after the country's reeling, 3,000 Americans, 2,997, lost their lives that day. And George W. Bush, the President of the United States, returns three days later to New York City. And this is the story he told about his visit three days after the attacks to New York City. I had spent a fair amount of time in New, York, in New York City over the years, but it wasn't until September 14, 2001, that I got a sense of the city's real character. After the visit to Ground Zero, we drove three miles north to the Javits Center. I was amazed by the number of people on the West Side Highway waving flags and cheering. I hate to break it to you, Mr. President, Rudy Giuliani, the mayor of New York City, joked, but none of these people voted for you. At the Javits Center, I walked into a staging area for first responders from across the country. I greeted firemen and rescuers from states as far away as Ohio and California. Without being asked, they had come to the city to serve as reinforcements. I thanked them on behalf of the nation and urged them to continue their good work. 
the building's parking garage had been converted into a gathering place for about 200 members of the missing first responders. The, first, the people in the room spanned all ages, from elderly grandmothers to newborn babies. Many were living the same nightmare. Their loved ones had last been seen or heard near the World Trade Center. They wanted to know if they had survived. I had just seen the debris of the tower. I knew it would be a miracle if anyone emerged, yet the families refused to give up hope. We prayed together and cried together. Many people asked for pictures or autographs, and I felt awkward signing autographs in a time of grief, but I wanted to do anything I could to ease their pain. I asked each family to tell me a little bit about their missing loved one, and then I said, I'll sign this card, and when your dad or mom or son or daughter comes home, they'll believe that you really met the president. As I came to the last corner of the room, I saw a family gathered around a seated woman. I sat down next to her, and she told me her name was Arlene Howard. Her son was a Port Authority police officer who had had September 11th off, but volunteered to help as soon as he heard about the attacks. He had last been seen rushing into the dust and smoke three days later. As I was getting ready to say goodbye, Arlene reached into her purse and held out her hand. It contained a metal object. This is my son's badge. His name is George Howard. Please remember him, she said, as she pressed the badge into my hand. I promised that I would. I served 2,685 days as President of the United States after Arlene gave me that badge, and I kept it with me every one of them. As the years passed, most Americans returned to life as usual. That was natural and desirable. It meant that the country was healing and people felt safer. As I record these thoughts, that day of fire is a distant memory for some of our citizens. The youngest Americans have no firsthand knowledge of the day. Eventually, September 11 will come to feel more like Pearl Harbor Day an honored date on the calendar, and an important moment in history, but not a scar in the heart, not a reason to fight on. For me, the week of September 11 will always be something more. I still see the Pentagon smoldering, the towers in flames, and that pile of twisted steel. I still hear the voices of the loved ones searching for survivors, and the workers yelling, do not let me down, and whatever it takes. I still feel the sadness of children, the agony of burn victims, and the torment of broken families. I still marvel at the bravery of the firefighters and the compassion of strangers and the matchless courage of the passengers who forced down that plane. September 11 redefined sacrifice, it redefined duty, and it redefined my job. The story of that week is the key to understanding my presidency. There were so many decisions that followed, many of them controversial and complex, yet after September 11 I felt my responsibility was clear. For as long as I held office, I could never forget what happened to America that day. I would pour my heart and soul into protecting the country, whatever it took. Ladies and gentlemen, we're almost 20 years post 9-11 now, and I think the country has healed, and I think it's gotten better. I think we've moved on with our lives, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I don't, my challenge to you isn't to remember September 11th. It certainly is. I, I want you to remember the 3,000 Americans that died and, and the incident that happened because we've been at war your entire life. And part of that is because of what happened on September 11th. The president made a decision, George W. Bush, that we weren't going to let terrorists hit us again. We were going to go to them before they came to us. And there's lots of stuff that goes into that and lots of back and forth about whether that was the right decision. But that's the, the decision he made. But my challenge for you today is to, yes, remember September 11th. It's going to be like Pearl Harbor. For you, it's a historical event. But I, want, but I want you to live like September 12th. Here's what I mean. On September the 12th, 2001, not a single American cared who won the next presidential election or who won the last one. Nobody cared who, if they voted for Bush, if they didn't vote for him. Nobody cared what party you were, what your last name was. We were just one country that wanted to come together and heal and help those that were struggling and rally behind whatever was coming next and say to these terrorists, you're not going to let us, you're not going to make us not live our lives. This is America. And we'll deal with you, we'll deal with the terrorists, but we are going to live our lives and we're not going to live our lives in fear. I want you to be that kind of an American. When you get out into this crazy, polarized, sometimes insane world, I want you to be an Amer a September the 12th American. Be, be that American every single day. That's how you remember September 11th and honor the legacy of those that died. Be September 12th Americans. 
History's cool. Learn about it. Thanks for watching.